Chin Fo hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a Rocky Mountain High, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at mile marker 420 in colorful Colorado. It is Saturday, July 17th. Sunday, July 18th, for those of you across the pond and beyond, welcome to We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm so glad you could join us this evening. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and I hope you guys had an awesome weekend. Man, we just got through the 4th of July a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't know, it just seems like it's getting hotter and hotter. And it's going to get even hotter because we're going to have an epic show tonight. So if you're listening live right now, you're listening to We Are Paradox Media on Spreaker. You can also find us on KPNL Radio, which you can find at kpnl-db.com. We're also found on Twitter, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Tumblr, YouTube, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, as well as Podcast Addict and Podcast Chaser. So tonight, I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight, we will be hanging out and telling freaky deaky ghost stories. That's right. It's just me and you, boo. So, I'm so glad you're here with me, Tessa T&T, to, uh, you know, get through this stuff together. These stories are pretty epic. So this first one I found is from reddit ghost stories and the user is sunrise underscore eyes seven and the title of this story is my cliche cemetery ghost sighting i've been binge reading stories on this sub lately and thought i'd share my own so i know this isn't a super terrifying story though i have a couple of those as well but this was the one and only time I've ever seen an apparition with my own eyes. I say it's cliche because ghosts in the cemetery is like paranormal story 101. Laugh out loud. Background. I grew up in the country. We had lots of strange, bizarre things happen to us during that time. Aliens, paranormal, etc. I lived in a house surrounded by fields and forests and no cable or internet. Not that those were really a big thing back then anyway. So I spent most of my time outdoors. This happened when I was in my early teens. My best friend and I were driving to go bring some food to my dad and his friend who were working late at night on some scrap metal down the way from us. To get to where they were, there were two ways to go. One was the normal paved back road, and the second was a long old dirt road that people didn't really go down. The dirt road was surrounded by trees on both sides, had some sketchy old abandoned houses on either side, and a very old cemetery at the end. After we brought the food to them, we decided to take the old dirt road back as a joke. We used to walk that road every now and then during the day, even though it creeped us out. But we tried to stay away from it at night. We were both laughing about how the other one was too scared to go down it. She was driving and we were laughing and listening to music when we made the turn onto the road. It was a right hand turn, so in order to make the full turn, she had to sweep her headlights across the cemetery. I remember looking at the graves and that's when I saw her. It was an all white figure in the shape of a female with long dress and long hair. She was standing between the cemetery and the forest. I stared at her for what I felt was five to ten seconds before she vanished and then I continued to stare at that spot for a good ten seconds longer. Once I kind of came out of it I realized that the car was stopped and I have no idea for how long. My friend and I were both very quiet. We both kind of looked at each other like what the hell? Neither one of us really said anything for a while, but I finally asked her if she had seen something that she said she did. Not wanting to say what I saw first, I asked her what she saw and she described the figure exactly as I had above. Interestingly, neither one of us were afraid. I remember when I saw her, everything kind of went in slow motion. 
Even though there was music going on in the car, it was quiet and I definitely don't remember the car slowing down and stopping. I remember being in awe and thinking she radiated beauty and she still crosses my mind to this day. I'd been back there many times during both the night and day and haven't seen anything like it since. Anyway, thanks for reading if you're still with me. It's nice to be able to share these stories in a serious way without people looking at you like you've lost your mind. So she went back later and uh, she fixed a segment of the story and she said, I saw an all white figure of a long haired woman in a long dress in the cemetery at night. I didn't feel fear and I was just in awe. This next one is also set in a cemetery scene, and it is called The Cemetery Incident. And the writer of this, the user is libid underscore cabinet underscore 9197. A little backstory, I've always been interested in the paranormal. When I was in my younger 20s, I had heard from a high school friend that she was possessed at the local cemetery and had witnesses. I decided to check it out during the witching hours a couple nights later with a friend. This story isn't nearly as interesting as all of yours, but it definitely gave me goosebumps, and I can post about the possession in another post if y'all are interested. We got to the cemetery around 2.30 a.m. and began walking around. First the tombstone where the possession happened, which is the oldest part of the cemetery, but nothing happened. We walked around to various other places, including a mass statue of an angel-like being, like 15 foot high, and got the heebie-jeebies, nothing unusual. This cemetery is fairly large, and after this section, we had one more we wanted to check out before we went home. At this time, it was probably roughly 3.30 to 3.45. We approached the final section we had wanted to check. Slightly disappointed, this section is near the wood line for, for context. As we approach, we start to hear noises over by the wood line. Figured it is probably a rodent or something, nothing unusual, but we check it out anyway and don't find anything. Disappointed, yet again, we turn to leave. I pass a grave of a soldier that died a long time ago. As I pass, I hear leaves crunching behind me, and my shirt is pulled back to the point it's stretched across my chest. Obviously, at this point, I'm freaking out. I turn around to see if a tree branch could have gotten me, but the only branch near me was about six feet above my head. I told my friend, and he said he didn't notice anything. I was in the Marine Reserves at the time. I feel the soldier knew that, and that's why it reached out. Nothing else happened after that, and we left. Like I said, nothing crazy, but that's my two cents. This one is by user Mequinis56. It's spelled M-E-K-W-N-I-S-5-6. And it's called The Faces in the Wall and it's under Experience. This story was told to me by a close friend. I wasn't directly involved but was asked to go to the home after the incident. My friend lived in a small two-bedroom house. On occasion, my friend would allow people to stay with her. When this particular incident happened, my friend, I will call her T, had three people living with her. There was a woman, the woman's son, about three years old, and her boyfriend. On this particular afternoon, the little boy was laid down for a nap in T's room. About an hour after he went to sleep, the adults in the house were startled by screaming coming from the bedroom the child was in. 
When T reached the bedroom, she tried to open the door, but it would not budge. The other two adults tried as well, but no luck. They could hear the child screaming and saying that there were ugly faces in the wall and that they were trying to get him. The door gave way. Not too long after, they tried to open it, and the boy was rescued, but scared out of his wits. T inspected her bedroom and could not find anything that resembled a face or faces. When she called me and asked me to come over, she sounded shaken up, and when I got to her house, she explained what had happened. Context. I think the reason she called me is because of my upbringing. I was raised in a semi-traditional Native American home. My dad was a medicine man, so I had some knowledge about certain religious things as far as Chippewa, Cree, or Mount are concerned. She explained to me after the incident that the woman's boyfriend had recently learned about his Native American heritage and had delved headfirst into the culture. He really had no idea how to conduct any kind of ceremony, and he had practiced some kind of ritual in T's home. So I concluded that because of what he had done, he may have brought something into her home. Nothing further happened after that day or prior to my friend's home. Her guests left not too long after that incident, and I will never forget that story. This story is by Old Courage 1486, and the title is My Cat Left Me One Last Gift. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they've helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cedo. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cedo was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I had been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe twelve and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition whenever a pet pet died that I would make a con- concrete headstone with little marbles and their names on them. I don't know, you guys, I just kind of had to laugh because how many, how many pets passed? I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's, it's kind of sad. So she would make concrete headstones with little marbles and their names on them. She had set it on their kitchen counter to dry and left it there. The next morning, she checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. She went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there. They all said they hadn't. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle. I had it, and it still lives in there with a few of her whiskers I had found weeks following her passing. That's kind of creepy. It kind of reminds me of Pet Cemetery when Church came back. Poor little Church. Yeah, they're just never the same when they come back. Pretty creepy. User XX Frank underscore Torres XX. The Shadow Man. My mom told me that when she was younger, her friends used to play a Ouija board. The story is my mom one day at a sleepover, her friends decided they wanted to play a Ouija board. She, she told them that she was against the whole thing, that something bad might happen. 
They told her to stop being scared and it's only just for fun, but again, my mom said she didn't want to play. So they played without her, but she stayed with them to see what might happen. My mom said they asked a few questions, nothing happened, just messing around like moving the planchette to scare the other girls. Then she told me, as soon as they were about to wrap it up, the lights went out. Not only the candles lit the room, as my mom was about to scream, she saw a tall black shadow person in the corner of the room. Her friends must have saw the same thing, because soon after she saw it, her friends scream in horror and yelled, Someone is in the room with us! That's when they all yelled. The parents of the girl sleepover ran and asked all of them what's wrong. That's all my mom's story really says as she goes. She has more stories, and so do I, but she told me this one she was terrified of most. So there's a lot of different ones uh, popping up here on Reddit as far as uh, Reddit ghost stories. And then there's a lot of other paranormal pages on there. So if you guys like to read, I definitely implore you to check out this site and any others that are under the paranormal realm. It's super awesome to hear other people's encounters. So this one is by user It's the Cat 1120 and the title of this story is Isolated Cottage. Hello readers. I've recently posted my mum's story about this mysterious lady she saw in a village when she was growing up in Soviet Russia. This story happened when I think she was in her 20s. My dad worked at Nokia and as you know they had an office in Finland. My uncle had a cottage in this isolated forest where the smell of nature really put you into a calm mood. This area was quiet, no cars, no nearby houses, no shops, and just desolate roads. My uncle would invite my parents and my dad's friends to stay over. The day would usually go well. However, no one would ever step out of the house at night, not even to walk around the perimeter of the cottage. There was an eerie feeling which was holding them back from going outside. Of course, the area was very, very quiet, and that may have been the reason. Plus, wildlife would roam around. The cottage was old, and it was more of a summer house. Dusty rooms, etc., so due to its design, the living room and lounge had no curtains on the windows, which mean I don't know serial killers or people with bad intentions good looking really easily. My parents and their friends had chills every night. There was a feeling that was signaling danger. I feel like some life form was up to no good. I'm sure it was not just the animals or the isolation that was scary. It was something else. Could this cottage or area have had bad history? Note, this is a true story. My parents and their friends all had the same feeling of constant danger. And then below, it says, My parents moved from Russia to Finland, Finland to England. My next story will be about both my parents witnessing something chilling in their first flat in the UK. The precise location is somewhere in Red Hill, which is in Siri. User eat trash hyphen hell Satan. I don't know how I feel about the story already. <laughs> what a name! All right, so this one is called Pink the Ghost. 
Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, F19, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I'd be her roommate. I didn't need a place to stay, but decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and I had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I'd go to bed and at some point open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I'd get out of bed excited to see her only to, to discover I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I'd lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up and greet her only to see I was still alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet. The apartment was completely quiet and we heard this clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked. Each string in succession then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while living there, never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book from Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set up my guitar on the wall. But instead of closing the book, as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages stopped flipping on the song, Hey You. And when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone the other way, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, Oh, hey, Pink. But one night, I had been out with a friend until around 2 a.m., and when I opened my door and stepped in, I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, oh, hi, Pink, and I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment, so that's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease, not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything but never did and actually never really talked to them at all. And to answer some questions before they happen, my roommate and I were still and are still really good friends. Never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with her. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, 
the words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I usually don't tell people this because they usually don't believe me and I just rather not go through with the ridicule and name calling. However, with pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. This story is from user living underscore life underscore slowly. The title is Seeing an Orb in Real Life. This story takes place when I was young, between 6 to 10, but I'm not sure of the exact time. It was summer and I was young enough to be put to bed before it was completely dark. My room was that kind of blue hue of dark that happens around dusk. I had my eyes closed, but somehow the room became super bright, almost like the sun was shining right window, which didn't happen in that room at all. I opened my eyes, and there was a glowing orb hovering right over the foot of my bed. It was almost gold in the color, very much like the sun, but also a little like the heavenly glow you see in religious pictures. It made the room feel warmer and didn't really frighten me at all. It was rather calming. It also completely lit up the room brighter than daylight. I stared at it for a few moments and it then flew right out the closed and locked window and the room was dark again. That was the only time I saw it directly but would often see it out of the corner of my eye hovering over my bed when I was out of the room. Although any other time I saw it, it would be more of a silver tone or hue. At this point, with everything I've read, I'm wondering what I saw. Was this something benevolent or rather malicious? Please let me know if you have any insight. User, Dino, so, hers. So Dino Sowers, but so is capitalized. And the title is, Ghost in My Room? I might have a ghost in my room. I've been calling them Charles and Frederick. Both names make sense for them when I imagine Frederick. He's an older guy, maybe 30. And Charles is a little kid, maybe 10. They open my door at night, and whenever I have balloons in my room, they get wrapped together at the edges like someone was holding them or something. I get strange feelings like as if someone is watching me. So read it ghost stories. Do I have a ghost, or is it all my imagination? User brilliant hyphen P P E A five seven four seven title invisible friend. Okay, my girlfriend told me about this story where when she was young she had that invisible friend that some kids have, right? And innocently, like every parent, hers never really asked any real deep questions about it other than its name and things like that. So it stayed like that for many years until years later, a young guy approached her mother's, her mother at the store. It was the son of the past owner. Moved years ago, the guy wanted to say hi and ask how the house he grew up in was doing. After a little chat, her mother started talking about that friend 
her daughter had, and that is my girlfriend. And this is where things start to get weird. The friend that my girlfriend had had the exact same old lady name that that boy's deceased mother had, who had passed away a few years earlier to the sale. Although this story happened a couple of years after, my girlfriend stopped playing with her friend, and growing up she says that she can still remember some parts, like she remembers the playing and feeling her friend's presence. User, it's the cat 1120. And the title is Dark Lady True Story. Dark, stingy, lone lady. Sorry if this is the wrong subreddit. My mum comes from the Soviet Union. She used to live in a small village near a mining city. The city's name was. I can't even pronounce that. Let me see. Gino Shorok. That's what I want to say it is. Gina Shorok. My mom used to play and hang out with her mates. Times were different nowadays. Everyone is particularly strapped onto their phones or electrical devices. At one point, she was playing with her friends at around 12 p.m. in the night. This village had grass, plants, and wildlife around. Also, stuff like pedo were less common and not talked about. Hence why they could stay up and play. My mom says that she and her sister and her friends saw a dark figure slowly approaching. Her friend's group quickly hid near a bush which provided enough cover. This woman was wearing a long dark robe similar to what the mythical reaper would wear. Reaper, I think, is the creature who represents death. This mysterious lady's teeth were yellow and frigid. Her skin was horrible. My mom and her sister believed that this woman was on living on the planet for a while. Bear in mind that it was simply to hide away due to houses being left. The woman also had a torch or candle lit. Now, of course, they had wooden houses in my mom's village, and one of them lived an old lady. This mysterious lady would walk around the house in a comp... Com confident manner. The next day the lady died. My mom does not remember how, but as a kid, she would be freaked out. This story is true, and I felt like I should share it. Ask me any questions, and I will answer them. This story chills me. Could this lady be a witch? Who knows? User Sandra ZX6. Title Great Grandma. Okay, so only my family knows this. When I was 12, my great grandma had always told me I was a white witch. Mm, okay, G Grandma, and continued to tell me if there's a way to let me know there's something more after she died, she would try and contact me. Well, when I was 14, I was in the shower and was the only one in the house as everyone was at work. I bunked school saying I was ill, laugh out loud, anyway, in the shower and someone called my name. I looked out from behind the shower curtain and saw a dark, small shadow walk across the landing into my parents' room. I ignored it and kept showering to be called again, but louder, and the same thing happened. Dark shadow walked across the landing into my parents' room. So, as a freaked out 14-year-old, I jumped out of the shower, threw a towel on me, put a coat on over the top to run five minutes down the shops to where my mom managed one of them. She was on the phone when I got there and was told, and I was told to sit in the office. She finished the phone call and said, what's wrong? I told her everything and she said, well, that phone call was to tell me 
Your great-grandma has just passed away about 20 minutes ago. What the hell? So was that my great-grandma telling me there's something more? Bum, 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 bum. User brilliant hyphen P five seven four seven. Okay, this story is pretty big, intense, and hard to believe. And not knowing me, you will probably not believe me, but for what it's worth, I swear on my life that this is all true. So we moved to that house when I was younger, and since day one, weird things were happening. We had a mountain dog, and in our old house, she would literally spend her whole winter days sleeping outside in the snow. So liking so much the cold, you guessed it, she would always spend the summers lying in the basement ceramic to cool down. But not in this house. On the first night, I could feel that something was going on. My dog always sleeping in my bed, I went ahead the first night and closed the light. About four minutes into complete darkness, my dog on my left side and my room door on my right, I saw my dog raising her head and staring at the long, dark corridor. She stared about nine seconds before she started crying and kind of panicking. I freaked out, opened the light, nothing was there. I went back to bed, the dog laid down beside me again. Ten minutes later, just the same, but now she's growling. I opened the light. She jumped out of the bed and ran into my parents' room. She never went in the basement since, and every time she would come would be during the day because I would kind of force her in my room with food. She would take it, look nervously around her, and run back upstairs with her tail in her ass, even during crazy hot weather. When playing on my computer at night once, my computer mouse flew from my desk to my face at about 45 degree angle up, which is impossible to have accidentally happen. There's even a night where I threw a party and as we all went to sleep at the end of the evening in a deep, dark basement, we were still talking in bed until we fell asleep. Sleeping like six to eight to nine people in each room anyway, about seven people in the room beside mine saw my friend that we were talking about to our other friend outside in a tent at the same moment, opened their door abruptly, burst into their room, opened the light, said some bullshit, and closed the light and slapped the door. Well, at least so they say. One of the girls in the room came into our room, opened our light, and asked, what the fuck? And this is where the story gets weird. My friend never stepped a foot into the house. He was outside the whole time. Neither, the, neither did he open the light, since it was pinched black and about 15 persons would have been seen. But on the other side, they are seven that all got woke up by the same thing. Our friend br busting into their room and opening the light. Sometimes at night, I would hear the ground crack as if someone would be walking toward my room from the end of the corridor, and it would stop right at my door. Lots of other little things happened, but the only attack incident we had so far, though, was the mouse in the face. User Buffalo underscore infidel. Story title Ghost Voices and Ghost Towns. Contextual background information followed by my brief encounter. Tombstone, Arizona has been incorrectly associated with lawlessness and vigilantism. Aside from the Erb Clanton fight at the OK Corral, and a few other limited bouts of isolated violence, Tombstone was generally a respectable up-and-coming city with amenities comparable to places like San Francisco. 
There was, however, a town about 10 miles west along the banks of San Pedro that does deserve recognition as the stereotypical Wild West town, Charleston. Charleston was developed on the west bank of the San Pedro River to support the large silver mill located immediately across the river, aptly named Millville. Charleston was filled with multiple saloons and housed the majority of the workers at the silver mill. The outlaws typically associated with Tombstone, Curly Bill Brocious, the Clantons, McClurys, Johnny Ringo, etc., spent much more of their time transiting between Charleston in the west and Galeyville in the east due to the general lack of any law enforcement. They'd really only encounter Tombstone to get supplies they couldn't get elsewhere. Today, Charleston ruins can be found if you're determined. Weathered adobe walls can be found hidden amongst the cre creosote and mesquite along the eroded high banks of the San Pedro. Millville is along a dedicated, maintained trail equipped with infographics of the history of the area. In the summer of 2017, I returned to southern Arizona to revisit Charleston and Millville. Being monsoon season, I'd hoped to get in and out before the inevitable afternoon storm rolled in. As far as I could tell, I was the sole soul in the vicinity. Stone foundations and relics of the mining operations that once occurred here are commonplace. I saw a cool old metal pill hidden in the grass near an old stone foundation. The wind was still and it was silent beyond my footsteps. I picked up the pill to get a closer look and immediately a very disgruntled voice called out, What the hell do you think you're doing? I assumed some overly passionate local had come up the trail while I wasn't paying attention and wasn't happy that I was touching things. Nope. I paused, did a 360 scan of the area, and found that I was still definitely alone. I set the pell down and finished the trail loop thinking I might run into the source of the noise. Never saw another person out there that day and still managed to get caught in the monsoon shortly thereafter. Not the most exciting encounter, but it's the only time in my life that I cannot reasonably explain. Side note, right up the road from Millville, literally within 700 meters, or several hundred meters, is purportedly one of the most haunted places in Arizona, and it's called Brunkow's Cabin. Dig into that for some gruesome, gruesome history. And then a TLDR, I found an old metal bucket in a ghost town and a ghost yelled at me when I picked it up. So I think that's kind of just the summing it up. That was, that was a pretty good story. I enjoyed that one. User Mech W Nis fifty six McWinnis M E K W N I S fifty six and the title is My First Ghost Encounter. This experience happened several years ago when I was still in elementary school. My dad and I went to visit some relatives on the Blackfoot Reservation, which we did often. When we arrived at my aunt and uncle's trailer, the first thing I did was run in to see my aunt. As I went past the first bedroom in the hallway, I noticed an old woman and old man in the room. One was sat next to the bed, and one was laying on the bed. When I reached my aunt, who was in the furthest bedroom, we hugged and she gave me a kiss, and I asked her who the people were in her daughter's bedroom. My aunt looked at me suspiciously and asked what I meant. I told her that I saw an old man and an old woman in her daughter's bedroom. My aunt became angry and said that I had lied, and there was only one person in that room, and that was her father. The woman could not have been in the room because she had died a year before. Later, when my aunt told my dad what I had said, he told her that I couldn't help myself and that seeing things like ghosts were something children were able to see. I went to visit my aunt and cousins. I just learned to keep things to myself, knowing that if 
If I were to see something again, it would only frighten people. User is J H J H J H J H J H J H J H A J S, and the title is Garage Goblin. So over the past two years, I have dealt with a very mischievous entity living in my garage. I don't think it would hurt us. At least I would hope not. When my daughters and I moved to the mountain home and rented this place, it would flicker lights and open and close the garage door. Last year, I had a foster daughter who was quite the troubled teen and set up her room in the garage, but after spending two nights in it, she said she was uneasy about being in there. When we went out of town, we came back to her screaming and crying, saying the goblin wouldn't leave her alone and was making too much noise. It only bugs those who are all alone. If we are the only ones up, it will act up too. Last week, I got up to use the facilities and get a snack, and while in the restroom, heard what on I thought was my daughter open the fridge. Opened the bathroom door only to see no one in the kitchen and everyone around asleep. It makes all kinds of loud noise, and if anyone is alone. My daughter cleansed it with sage, and I did my in Jesus me be gone, nothing has yet to work. Any ideas? If you guys have any ideas for this poor lady, reach out to her on Reddit Ghost Stories and yeah, I told you what her, her name was, so you can check back in the show later. Um, I'll go ahead and read it to you again. User J H J H J H J H J H J H J H A J S and let her know what your thoughts are on this. So the next user is brilliant hyphen P5747. And the title is Dark Men Staring at You in Front of the Bed. When I was younger, I had that first encounter at our first house. It was the night that my mom was changing my window blinds and got them to the store, and since they had to repair something, I had to spend one night without blinds, which wasn't too bad. Anyways, I always had a pain falling to sleep. So about an hour and a half in my bed trying to fall asleep with the moon shining up in my room. At one point, I felt really weird. Felt like something wasn't right. You know that feeling when you walk somewhere and you feel like someone is watching you. You turn around and you make eye contact with someone. It was just the same. I tried to fight, fight it since I wanted to fall asleep, since it had been a bit, I was in bed already. But curiosity uh, took control. I opened my eyes and saw it. Suspended, head down, on the right top side of my window was that big black shadow staring at me. So deep that I could see the sky beside and not even a single reflective light would shine through. As I started panicking, I wanted to scream, I wanted to run, but was paralyzed, only my eyes could move around. It took a few seconds, and it left, but took me a while to actually unparalyze. It was actually the next morning that I realized that I stayed like that until I was out of energy and fell asleep. For years, I kept that story to myself until my sister came up to me six weeks ago around a cup of coffee and told me a story where she had encountered as well in her room, but the shadow was beside her bed and the story was practically the same. So on that note, boys and girls, on this music break, we have Miss McKaylin Hay with Devil You Know, Pins and Needles, as well as Mirror, and then we have Miss Tracy Cruz with Joyful Rain. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. 
Again, we have Miss McKaylin Hay, as well as Miss Tracy Cruz. Thank you, ladies, so much for being our musical break this evening. And thank you so much to Mr. Roy Washington, a.k.a. Quest Nation, for being our musical host. Without you, we'd have commercials for breaks. So I'm so grateful that we have music because, to me, music is the universal language. It's also really good medicine. Depending on what mood you are, there's so many different ki uh, kinds of medicine out there for you. So I kind of wanted to shift gears, as the attorneys have been saying in uh, the Dylan Redwine trial. I'm going to shift gears really quick. So, uh, yeah, I want to go into something else. Instead of all these Reddit ghost stories, I want to get into the Skinwalkers. So, pretty stoked about this because... Living in Cortez, Colorado, near the Toyok Reservation, and then now living in Bayfield near um, the Ignacio Reservation, and then driving from here to Phoenix, Arizona to visit my mom and sister, we've had different encounters. So um, this to me is something that is very interesting. So this story comes from RiverCityGhost.com. And the title of this is The Terror of the Skinwalker, the Native American Boogeyman, posted by a blogger in River, River City Ghosts. America is a hodgepodge of cultures, traditions, folklore tales, and nasty critters of the deep. We simply love to collect monsters and boogeymen from other religions and regions. This great plain of a country, a blank slate if you like, had an ingrained quality that most other religions lacked. There wasn't an all-encompassing religious dogmatic belief, not a single one, one-of-a-kind, deistic system. Not only that, but most natives had separate governmental auto autocracies. Each tribe had their own gods, their own trade unions, their own political echelon. There was no empire, no Ottomans, no Brits, no Spaniards, nothing. Just small roaming, sometimes nomadic people. Then, when the Europeans came, it was a free-for-all. America was split into bite-sized bits of monarchy and everyone, plus their grandmother, had a stake in it. The Dutch, the French, the Brits, the Spaniards, and each and every one of them brought along their traditions and folklore beliefs. Over time, things sort of melted together, and even better, we started having uh, auto-octonous stories and tall tales. Paul Bunyan, Old Stormalong, the Lorona, and Loveland Frogman, the Luska, everything Lovecraft pinned up, Nonetheless, the old tales remained. They appeared and became culturally relevant in modern times. And one of those, even in a bastardized form, was the Navajo's big, nasty boogeyman, the Skinwalker. Well, that was long. Let's get to it. What is the Skinwalker? The Skinwalker is an ancient Native American legend that takes on various forms across tribes. The Navajo lore, a Skinwalker, Yinarlushi, I think is how it's said, is a kind of wicked sorcerer who can transform into, occupy, or disguise themselves as an animal. The myth behind this shape-shifting being known as the Skinwalker has mostly been consigned the label of either hoax or too much peyote, or simply oral traditions transfixed to all cultures' beliefs. The Navajo Skinwalker, nevertheless, has deep roots in Aboriginal American folklore. Other tribes throughout the region also have their own version of the Skinwalker. The Pueblo people, Apache, and Hopi each have their own unique interpretation of what a Skinwalker might be. Theories on what a skinwalker might be. Some customs hold tight to the belief that skinwalkers are produced when a medicine man abuses magic for evil, when they corrupt the natural order of things. 
The medicine man, now an entity for evil, becomes a Sith Lord. He or she is given awesome powers by the pollution. These powers differ from tradition to tradition. The few things this malicious transformation does have through all tribes is the Sith Lords now command over another beast, their ability to turn into different animals and their capacity to possess other people from their tribe. In other traditions, a person, man, woman, or child becomes a skinwalker when they perform any kind of deep-seated taboo similar to the Wendigo curse. Finally, yet another theory, one that's tied up to creation myths, states that skinwalkers were once the helpers of divine beings. In Navajo stories, the Nagloshi were agents for the holy people when they were first training humans in their blessing way. Nagloshi were supposed to abandon the mortal world with the holy people, but a few decided to stay behind. Their greed and desire to stay in the mortal plane corrupted the power the holy people gave them and transformed them into malicious semi-divine beings. Some tribes differentiate between Naagloshis and skinwalkers. The former, the Native American equivalent of fallen angels, while the latter a mortal with a gift for black magic. How to kill a skinwalker? They are reportedly near impossible to kill. Some traditions state a bullet, knife, or spear dipped in white ash might be able to kill a skinwalker. He who must not be named. Just like Voldemort and Fight Club, you do not talk about skinwalkers. I'm putting my neck on the line just writing about them. Widespread belief in tribal custom warms that talking about wicked beings is not only bad luck, but somehow calls out to them and makes their appearance all the more likely. Think Beetlejuice. Given that caveat, little, if anything, is really known about the Skinwalker. The Navajo are staunchly hesitant to discuss their boogeymen with outsiders. Even amongst each other, the subject is considered taboo. What happens when Rowling pulls this in is we as Native people are now opened up to a barrage of questions about these beliefs and traditions, that these are not things that need or should be discussed by outsiders. Native American writer and historian Adrian Keene explained on how J.K. Rowling's, J.K. Rowling's, or other pop culture phenomenons like Supernatural or Grimm that employ of similar entities in their narratives have the affected indigenous people who believed in the skinwalker. There are many anecdotes about skinwalkers online, particularly in Reddit. These occurrences usually transpire on Native American reservations and are supposedly only interrupted by the blessings of a medicine man. The descriptions of the being are essentially always the same, a four-legged brute with a disturbingly human, albeit marred, face, and orange-red gleaming eyes. Those who have seen a skinwalker also stated that they were fast and made fiendish cries. Skinwalker Ranch Skinwalker Ranch, also known as Sherman Ranch, is a business located around 512 acres, or 207 hectares southeast of Bellard, Utah. It is thought to be the site of countless paranormal incidents and UFO-related activities. The land, many believe, is cursed, perhaps even the inhabited of a skinwalker. Here's a nifty little map that shows Skinwalker Ranch and other areas that are also affected as Skinwalker Ranch are. So, some of the things that have occurred on the property. Terry Sherman, the owner of the property way back in 1996, was walking his dogs around the farm late at night when he came upon a wolf. A wolf three times the size of a normal lupine, with glowing red eyes and a mean streak. Terry shot the thing with a rifle at close range, like throwing pebbles at Wolverine's skeleton. 
cow mutilations, crop circles, and UFO sightings at least once a week. One of the cattle was found with a hole cut into the center of its left eyeball. Another had its rectum cut out. Then one day, seven cows disappeared. If it's snow, it's hard for a 1,200 or 1,400 pound animal to just walk off without leaving tracks or to stop and walk backward completely and never miss their tracks. And this was a quote by Terry Sherman. The thing that spooked Terry the most and made him sell off his property were the voices. Sherry, sorry, Terry Sherman heard voices while walking his dogs. Sherman described that the dogs spoke in a language that he didn't understand. They seemed to come with the wind and out of the darkness. He felt as if they were invoking something. The ranch was sold to UFO fanatic and Las Vegas realtor Robert Bigelow for $200,000 in 1996. The man established the National Institute for Discovery Science on the grounds and put up abundant surveillance in the property. Things just got weirder. Bigelow sold the ranch later on to Adamantium. Since taking over Skinwalker Ranch, the Steely Company has introduced all manner of surveillance equipment all over the property. Cameras, alarm systems, infrared, etc. Paranormal events are commonplace. I take my truck up the road, and as I start to get closer, I start to get really scared. Just this feeling that takes over. Then I hear this voice, as clear as you and me talking right now, that says, Stop. Turn around. I lean out the window with my spotlight out and start searching around, and nothing. Thomas Winterton interviewed by Vice. Winterton, along with several employees, was hospitalized after experiencing severe skin inflammation and nausea while working on the ranch. To this day, there hasn't been a clear medical diagnosis for what happened to them. Skinwalker in Popular Culture In 2018, a documentary based on Dr. Colm Keller's one of the researchers employed by Bigelow, book Hunt for the Skinwalker, hit the press. It once more galvanized the interest in the creature. Aside from Harry Potter, Supernatural, and Grimm, those fiendish creeps have shown up in a series such as HBO's The Outsider and the History Channel's The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. So there's a couple different links here. All that is interesting dot com backslash skinwalker. We also have vice.com um, and you can look under Inside Skinwalker Ranch, a paranormal hotbed of UFO research. Then also wikipedia.org backslash wiki backslash skinwalker underscore ranch. And then um, en.wikipedia.org wiki skinwalker. So there's so many different stories out there. I have a few, but you guys have already heard them. So I don't want to bore you with that. But we have another one here. And it's called Meet the Navajo Skinwalker, the Demonic Shapeshifter that Native Americans won't mention by name. And this article is from All That Is Interesting or all that's interesting.com and the writer is Marco Margaritoff. The shape-shifting skinwalker takes on various forms across tribes but most agree on what it looks like, a deformed animalistic body, marred face and blazing red eyes. The legend of the shape-shifting entity known as the skinwalker has largely been relating or related to hoax status. After all, it is difficult to believe that a humanoid figure has been transforming into a four-legged animal and terrorizing families in the American Southwest. While unscientific, the Navajo skinwalkers do have deep roots in Native American lore. The rest of America got its first real taste of the Navajo legend in 1996 when the Deseret News published an article titled Frequent Flyers. The story chronicled a Utah family's traumatizing experience with a supposed creature that included cattle mutilations and disappearances. 
UFO sightings, and the appearance of crop circles. But the family's most distressing encounter occurred one night just 18 months after moving onto the ranch. Terry Sherman, the farmer of the family, was walking his dogs, and yes, we just went over the story, when he encountered a wolf. No ordinary wolf. It was three times bigger than a normal one. Sounds a lot to me like a dire wolf. And it stood unfazed by three close-range shots. The Sherman family weren't the only ones to be traumatized on the party. After they moved out, several new owners experienced eerily similar encounters with these creatures, and today, the ranch has become a hub of paranormal research that's aptly renamed Skinwalker Ranch. While paranormal investigators probe the property with novel inventions, what they seek has a history that is centuries old. This is the legend of the Navajo Skinwalker. So, the Navajo legend... So what is a skinwalker? As the Navajo English Dictionary explains, the skinwalker has been translated from the Navajo yi nadluushi. This literally means, by means of it, it goes on all fours, and the yi nadluushi is merely one of many varieties of skinwalkers called an... I can't even pronounce these words. Anti... Me, anti me, anti me. The Pueblo people, Apache and Hopi, also have their own legends involving skinwalker. Some traditions believe that skinwalkers are born of a benevolent medicine man who abuses indigenous magic for evil. The medicine man is then given mystical power of evil. That very tradition to tradition, but the power all traditions mention is the ability to turn into. Or possess an animal or person. Other traditions believe a man, woman, or child can become a skinwalker should they commit any kind of deep-seated taboo. Oh my goodness, the simply safe thing keeps popping up. Get out of here, creeper. The skinwalkers are described as being mostly animalistic physically, even when they are in human form. They are reportedly near impossible to kill except with a bullet or knife dipped in white ash. Little more is known about the purported being as the Navajo are staunchly reluctant to discuss it with outsiders and often even amongst each other. Traditional belief portends that speaking about the malevolent beings is not only bad luck but makes their appearance all the more likely. Native American writer and historian Adrian Keene explained how J.K. Rowling's use of the similar entities in Harry Potter series affected indigenous people who believed in the skinwalker. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is possibly this person saw the other person's article or vice versa, and they just kind of copied each other but changed a few words. <sighs> so what happens when Rowling pulls this in? is we as Native people are now opened up to a barrage of questions about these beliefs and traditions, said Keen, but these are not things that need or should be discussed by outsiders. In 1996, a couple of outsiders were introduced to the legend after a series of inexplicable events that occurred on their own ranch. Okay, so that's where Terry and Gwen Sherman come in. First, they observe UFOs of varying sizes hovering above their property. Then seven of their cows died or disappeared. One was reportedly found with a hole cut into the center of its left eyeball, and another had its rectum carved out. Yes, we read that. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this. Oh, you can get in trouble for this. So the cattle the Shermans did find dead were both surrounded by an odd chemical smell. One was found dead in a clump of trees. The branches above appeared to have been cut off. One of the cows that vanished had left tracks in the snow that suddenly stopped. If it's snow, it's hard for a 1,200-pound or 1,400-pound animal. Yes, we heard that quote before. Perhaps most terrifying were the voices. Heard that one, too. Wow, but it's a little different. So Terry heard voices while walking his dogs late one night. Sherman reported that the voices spoke in a language he didn't recognize. He estimated that they came from about 25 feet away, but he couldn't see a thing. 
His dogs went berserk, barked, and ran back hastily to the house. After the Shermans sold their property, these incidents only occurred. Are skinwalkers real? Oh, here we go again with Mr. Bigelow. Man, I don't want to repeat myself. Maybe I should just leave this article because it's talking again about Robert Bigelow buying this property for $200,000 in 1996. I discovered the National Institute for Discovery Science. Um, Dr. Colm Keller spotted a large humanoid figure perched in a tree. Yep, haven't heard that one yet. Okay, so the goal was to assess what exactly had been going on there. So on March 12th, 1997... Bigelow's employee, biochemist Dr. Colm Keller, spotted a large humanoid figure perched in a tree. And then it's detailed in his book, which, yes, we read this before, was Hunt for the Skinwalker. And the creature was 20 feet off the ground and about 50 feet away. The large creature that lay motionless, almost casually, in the tree. The only indication of the beast's presence was the penetrating yellow light of the unblinking eyes as they stared fixedly back into the light. Keller fired at the supposed skinwalker with a rifle, but it fled. It left claw marks and imprints on the ground. Keller described the evidence as signs of a bird or prey, maybe a raptor print, but huge, and from the depth of the print, from a very heavy creature. This was only a few days after another unnerving incident. The man, uh, ranch manager and his wife had just tagged a calf before their dog began acting strangely. They went back to investigate 45 minutes later and in the field in broad daylight found the calf and its body cavity empty, said Keller. Most people know if any 84-pound calf is killed, there is blood spread around. It was as if all the blood had been removed in a very thorough way. The distressing activity continued well into the summer. Three eyewitnesses saw a very large animal in a tree and also another large animal at the base of the tree, continued Keller. We had videotape equipment, night vision equipment. We started hunting around the tree for the carcass and there was no evidence whatsoever. Ultimately, Bigelow and his research team experienced over 100 incidents on the property, but couldn't amass the kind of evidence that scientific publication would accept with credulity. Bigelow sold the ranch to a company called Adamantium Holdings for $4.5 million in 2016. Well, I must say, that was a very nice turnaround. Ooh, skinwalker stories, shapeshifters, and pop culture. So there are many stories about skinwalkers online in such forums as Reddit. These experiences commonly occur on Native American reservations. While it's difficult to discern just how truthful these accounts are, the tr descriptions are always the same. A four-legged beast with disturbingly human, albeit marred face and orange-red glowing eyes. Those who have claimed to have seen these skinwalkers also said that they were fast and made hellish noise. Skinwalkers have crept back into popular culture through TV series such as shows on HBO's The Outsider and the History Channel's upcoming The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. For horror-centric programming, a vertically demonic being that roams the countryside is rather perfect. Since taking uh, over Skinwalker Ranch, Adamantium has installed equipment all over the property, including cameras, alarm systems, infrared, and more. Most alarming, however, are the accounts from company employees. According to Vice, employee Thomas Winterton was one of several who randomly experienced skin inflammation and nausea after working on the grounds. Some had to be hospitalized with no clear medical diagnoses for their condition. This and the following account parallel some of the inexplicable events featured in sci-fi shows like The Outsider. As Winterton reported, I take my truck up the road, and as I start to get closer, I start to get really scared. Just this feeling takes over, and I hear this voice that says, Stop, turn around, and I lean out the window with my spotlight out and start searching around, and nothing. And then there's an article here that says, 
ranch family terrorized by unknown forces. So, despite this dreadful experience, Winterton reported that he isn't leaving Skinwalker Ranch anytime soon. It's like the ranch calls to you, you know, he said with a wry smile. So, yeah, it's funny how some reporters are just kind of copying each other because that article to me, okay, so let's see, what are the dates on these? River City goes, let's see what this one says, because now I'm curious. Oh, interesting, interesting, really, yeah, so this guy didn't even put a date on his, and that's River City Ghosts, okay, all that is interesting.com, this came out May 24th, 2021. So I wish I knew when the other one was reported because it's not cool. Hmm. Yeah, I don't want to read about Skinwalker Ranch. I don't know about you guys or if you ever watched um, the Skinwalker Ranch show on History Channel, but it was pretty slow moving. But people did experience things like they were saying... Uh, skin inflammation, rashes, nausea, that sounds a lot to me like nuclear poisoning, radiation. Very interesting. So here, 12 people tell their terrifying encounters with Navajo skinwalkers. So, number one is Yenaldlu, she is watching me. You know, blue, she is watching me. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious for lack of a better word. She's not religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana and she grew up in Nevada. One year when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, typical boring old people stuff, except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window and when someone asked what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenaldu she is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's now 19, we're in the front yard that evening, planting flowers, when all of a sudden, my grandmother starts shouting, Insert little brother's name here. Get away from that creature. It's not safe. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog, it was staring at my grandmother with an intensity I'd never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but do remember it had been really deep yellow eyes that I had seen. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, The Yenald Lushi is found me. She moved a couple weeks after that. I wonder if moving would really help that. I don't know. So this one is called On the Res Alone at Night. My uncle and cousin saw a large deer on the side of the road. When they got closer, it hopped over the fence like a bipedal man. One time driving back from Gallup, my dad saw an old Navajo woman walking on the side of the road. When he slowed to offer her a ride, she took off into the plains quickly with inhuman speed. Once when I was a kid, my family was at my aunt's house, which is in a rural, secluded area, when we were toyed with by a few entities. They would make animal noises, and when we looked to that direction from which the noises were coming, they would turn a flashlight on and off. The noises would come from all directions in increasingly shorter succession. 
Usually when I'm there on the reservation visiting, alone at night, I will feel the presence of evil and dread. Panic and paranoia will wash over me, and as sudden as it comes, it will leave. Number three, it moved like a toy rocking horse. My uncle is Mexican and Native American. This happened in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. He was driving around with his girlfriend late at night, and they saw something that looked like a huge black dog on the other side of the road. He slowed down, and the dog began crossing the road. Instead of walking like a normal dog would, this thing moved like a toy rocking horse. He said it stopped in the middle of the road and stared right at them, and its eyes had a red glow. My uncle is the most badass person I know, and it scared the crap out of him. Number four, they ran away on their back legs. So this happened about 12 years ago. My family owns a farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter, I was home from Christmas taking care of the farm while my parents were away Christmas shopping. As I was home by myself way late in the night and I hear all the cows freaking out, I knew it had to be the wild dogs that are rampant in the area. So I throw on some boots, grab a shotgun, load it up, and head out to the field. This was a perfect scenario for a horror movie. It was cloudy, but there was a full moon, and it was breaking through the clouds just right to light up the snow. I ran out into the middle of the field, and just in time to see two dogs. They were standing up, facing each other, and fighting. I think, perfect, two for one. So I pumped the shell into the chamber of Mr. 12 Gauge, and then it happened. The two dogs heard the rack. They both stopped, looked over at me, and ran away on their back legs. Immediately, I froze. In every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other native languages and legends I grew up with flew through my mind. Keep in mind, I am a white guy, and up until then, these were all just boogeyman stories the native kids liked to tell to scare us. That night, they became real to me. Number five, I had a dog's body, but with human hands and feet. Oh, it had a dog's body with human hands and feet. I'm like, well, that's weird. You did? So I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August, and my cousins' ages ranged from 10 to 15, and I was the oldest, being 15. I was staying with a 10, 13, and 14-year-old. We stayed up telling scary stories often, but one night, a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far. When you're driving down the road to her house, but in the backyard, it's thick forest with man-made paths through it. Each house is on a hill, so only part of the basement was actually underground. That isn't important until later, though. So, we're towards the east side of her yard in a smallish patch of open land. You couldn't see the neighboring yards from there, and there was probably three quarters a mile to each side of us that belonged to my grandma. It was maybe 11 at night, and we were playing truth or dare after telling scary stories, and my 14-year-old cousin dared me and the 13-year-old to go walk through the paths for 10 minutes or so. I said yes right away. As I wasn't easily scared and rather level-headed, but my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark yet, and we can see enough to not die. We were walking through the paths for about five minutes and can barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn. In the middle of the path was a large dog-like creature humped over with its front hands an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so fucking bright white and it was a humanoid dog shaped with a human-like head but a dog-like body but human hands and feet. It looked right at us and I know I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away the opposite way from us towards a creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed bloody up and murder and the other cousins and my grandma ran to us. I don't remember much here because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly, but I did wake up in bed, so I assumed that I was brought up to the house. 
All the kids slept in the basement in a big room with sliding glass doors to the outside. As the room was on the side that wasn't underground, my bed was pressed against the big glass window, and I could see my cousins playing outside down below. The house is in Michigan, so it gets slightly chilly even in the end of August, and there was a slight breeze, so I put on a jacket and ran to join them outside, skipping bre breakfast, not wanting to miss out on anything fun. When I got down, I could tell they weren't playing, but rather running to get my grandma. Her dogs, both of them, were dead and ripped up. That night, we went to bed early. I woke up at maybe two in the morning because I felt something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting on the double bed opposite of me on the other side of the room. There was one bunk bed and two beds, two double beds, the double beds for me and my 14-year-old cousin. They were being quiet and staring at me. The 13-year-old nodded his head towards the window and I froze. They all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to see the side and I saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed so fucking loud and it bolted. My grandma called the police after I told her what happened and they found nothing. I went home after that and I have never been there during the night again. Number six, it was neither fully human nor fully animal. In July 2004, near Gallup, New Mexico, I had my first and only encounter with a skinwalker. Before this, I used to say, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, I'm a believer now. What I saw was not full human nor full animal. I was moving and had just completed the cleaning and was with my 10-year-old son. We had called it a night and were headed out to our new place. As we walked out the front door, I saw a figure move from behind my neighbor's car to a nearby tree that stood between our apartments. It didn't have red glowing eyes, snarling teeth, or a rotten smell. It did move quickly, but not quick enough to avoid the light from a nearby light. Post and porch lights. It didn't look at me or come toward me. It moved as if it were trying to avoid being seen. I was within 15 feet of it, but I did not look back to fully inspect it. What I saw was a wolf-like animal that sort of resembled the beast and Beauty and the Beast, just not cartoonish. It had brown fur that completely covered it. It wasn't a pelt. It was a very large wolf. It didn't have any human traits except for it walked on its hind legs. It cowered behind the trees as we got into our vehicle. When we got in, I asked my son, Did you see that? Thankfully, he hadn't. My brother-in-law insists that it wasn't a skinwalker because I would have never seen it. To this day, I can picture what I looked like and what it looked like, know they exist, and pray I never encounter one again. Number 7. The Grove This didn't happen to me, but a very close friend of mine. I've heard a lot about coyotes and skinwalkers and had a weird experience or two with coyotes. Creepiest was waking up to my sleeping bag being surrounded in paw prints without ever hearing them during the night. But never anything paranormal, so to speak. Patrick's story, however, kept me from going back to a favorite backcountry secret stash. He was leaving the area one morning had been camping there a couple days and said there was a coyote that always seemed to be close by, like in his peripheral vision, but never overt. He loaded up his truck and started to drive down the wash out to the fire road. At the end of the wash, he could see the coyote following him. When he pulled out onto the road, it was running next to him. Now he was freaked out, so he sped up. He said he was going 35 or so, and it was running alongside him, Definitely not possible. When he looked back, the coyote was running on two legs and was wearing what Patrick said looked like buckskin pants. An instant later, it was a person wearing a coyote fur keeping pace with his truck. When he looked again, it was gone. We never went back to the grove after that. Number eight. It was like it knew we knew what it really was. 
I decided to join my bestie Karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the res. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere but surrounded by rural homes. We go to college together, and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill. Nothing out of the ordinary, but then her grandma, not that old, around 67, said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it kind of acted strange, and it was ugly looking. Black, shaggy coat, looked like a mixed breed, a German Shepherd, and a lab, maybe? That night, we were watching a movie in the living room. Had big windows that looked out into the front where the cars are parked, nothing fancy. With the curtains wide open, Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and we were watching a movie. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf, and there were DVDs kept in there. Karen went to put back a DVD we had just watched, but she freaked out because that stray dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do from my point of view or hers. Usually, my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in. Res dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside houses are frowned upon in Navajo tradition. They're meant to protect the house and the owner. The other dogs seem to stay away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box. It ran off behind the shed. We went to Tuba City to get some groceries, came back to the house. The dog was nowhere to be seen. Nothing unusual. Grandma went to visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. About five o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. Both of us looked out since there had been no car heard and no dogs barking. Looking out the living room in window to the door, there was the dog trying to open the door with its paws, two paws wrapped around the brass door knob, standing on its hind legs. I thought that was weird. Weird, but wasn't really freaked out. But Karen was. She opened the door and chased it off. Grandma came back later, and Karen told her. Grandma didn't like what she heard. Got ready to sleep. We slept in the spare bedroom since it had two beds. One window with curtains opened a little. We turned off the light, but there was a sound coming from on top of the roof. Pitter-patter footsteps and scratching sounds and panting. It then sounded like it jumped off onto a large plastic water barrel they had. At first we heard what sounded like barking, but as it grew louder, the other dogs seemed to be barking at the same time also. But all of a sudden, something was running around the house barking and it was no dog. Nope, it wasn't. This barking sounded human, a deep male voice barking like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Woof, 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 ruff, ruff, arf, arf, arf. Just exactly like that, adding the W's, R's, and A's, then panting again by the window, and we started freaking out. Karen decided to, in my opinion, was stupid, open the curtains to look out. There was the stray dog on its hind legs looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk what I thought were two black holes in the neck, another pair of eyes twinkled. Think of those ugly glossy spider eyes staring at you, and the paws were deformed looking hands with overgrown somewhat thick and sharp fingernails. Again, both screaming and shutting the curtains closed, Grandma came running through the door and seeing it. First thing she did was grab ashes from the fireplace, load three shells into the shotgun and under her bed, bless herself in Navajo, and went outside to shoot it. Yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcome there and to get the hell out of here for it to go and linger somewhere else. Then both being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in. He prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather, blessed the place, made us eat bitter herbs called eagle's gull or something, and gave me an arrowhead. Apparently, I needed to carry one for protection and a little pouch called corn pollen. Seems to work pretty well. 
The medicine, si the medicine man said the, do the dog was a skinwalker, which in Navajo is a long word, but I call them Yoshis. The body of the stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, made an illusion so we wouldn't know it wasn't a real dog. He also said the Yoshis tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone straw to spit at someone. Think spitballs, but only deadlier. And get human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine man that day pulled a piece of human skull out of Grandma's right shoulder, pretty big, about two inches long and one centimeter thick. It was real because we watched him pull it out of her. That was intense. So you can read more on the creepy catalog. And in this article, it was uh, the Navajo Skinwalkers written by Sean Reverong. And yeah, like he's got some pretty, pretty awesome stories going on there. So on that note, boys and girls, we are going to go to our second music break on this break. It's all Tracy Cruz all the time. So just sit back and unwind as she sings these lovely melodies. So we have Tracy Cruz with emotional love, electricity, and flowers and candy. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this musical break. Thank you. 
to do my heart is so confused in the past it's been put down it's been shattered and then i'm left without any clue to know the real truth about what i found but with you i found my common ground
So that was Tracy Cruz. That was brought to us by Mr. Roy Washington. Thank you guys so much again for joining me, Tessa TNT, tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. It's been awesome to have you guys here. I hope you guys have been enjoying the stories because I have. Um, so yeah, getting back to the Skinwalker realm. And I'm super stoked about this because we have a future guest coming on who is Danae and um actually he's not Danae hmm he is aboriginal and he's got a lot of epic stories going on as far as skinwalkers and beyond as far as native american lore and such goes i'm super excited to have him on here in the near future so you guys Keep your ears open for it, because when it happens, you're not going to want to miss it. So, 14 facts about skinwalkers that will 100% scare the shit out of you. So, this is from thoughtcatalog.com, and it's by Mr. Jacob Gears. 1. A skinwalker is a person with the ability to transform into any different type of animal at will. Two, they are most frequently seen as coyotes, wolves, foxes, eagles, owls, or crows. Three, some can also steal the faces of different people and could appear as someone you know. Four, if you accidentally lock eyes with a skinwalker, they can absorb themselves into your body and take control of your actions. Five. Rare skinwalkers can also have the ability to enchant the powder of corpses and use the substance as a poison dust on victims. Six. The legend of skinwalkers originates from the Navajo, a southwestern tribe of aboriginals, a.k.a. Native Americans. 7. In the Navajo language, the word skinwalker is yi na and translates to he who walks on all fours. 8. Skinwalkers have only entered the public discourse relatively recently compared to other phenomena. In 1996, a team of scientists ventured to a Utah ranch to investigate a series of bizarre phenomena. Well, I must say, I knew about these fellows way before then. Nine. If their other powers weren't enough, skinwalkers are also said to be able to run incredibly long distances, some say over 200 miles in one evening. 10. Skinwalkers have a tendency to hang around graveyards and can dig up graves at an impossibly fast speed. 11. While they can take many forms, many people who see them today describe them as hollowed-out, dog-like animals. 12. Skinwalkers are said to recruit more skinwalkers themselves. There is some dispute on how this happens, but some say that there is an official ceremony and that skinwalkers only take their form with a gathering of people and specific chants. 13. With all of their advances, it is said that you can kill a skinwalker if you call them by their true human name. 14. Skinwalkers are most commonly encountered near native reservations, though they have been seen all over the United States. Skinwalker Ranch in Utah is the most famous. Some people believe that the rake is commonly encountered in the no northeast is similar to a skinwalker. So 13 people share their terrifying encounters with Navajo skinwalkers. So we surveyed all of Reddit for the most horrific and terrifying encounters with skinwalkers from Reddit. 
Yin Ald Lushi is watching me. And we read this story earlier, but here we go again. So my grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious. I don't know if I should read this again. I hate repeating myself. It's not very long though, so bear with me. Gah. <clears throat> so my grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious. For lack of better words, she's not religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was a grade school, I went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful. Typical boring old people stuff, except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window when someone asked what she was doing. She would simply reply, Yenald Lushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, were in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, insert little brother's name, here, get away from that creature, it's not safe. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all ran outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house, standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity I'd never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but do remember it had really deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, The Yenald Lushi has found me. And she moved a couple weeks after that. So number two, on the res alone at night. Man, is this the same ones? It's like, these stories are so guarded. Yes, these are the same stories. Oh my goodness. Yeah, these stories are so closely guarded that once they get out there, everybody uses them. And it's another case of repeated stories, basically people repeating each other's articles. Because we have not only the one I just read to you, but on the res alone at night, starting my uncle and cousin saw a large deer on the side of the road. When it hopped over the fence, it hopped over on its hind legs like a man. Um, the next one is it moved like a toy rocking horse. The next one, they ran away on their back legs. Oh my gosh. What a drag. It had a dog's body, but human hands and feet. We read that one. This is insane. Isn't there like a copyright or some sort of transcript infringement or something for this? It's neither fully human nor animal. The Grove. It was like it knew what we... What? It was like it knew we knew what it really was. Read that one. Wow. Used to be a skeptic, but not after this. Read that one. I mean, these are in the exact same freaking order as well. What the crack, peeps? Wow. Yep, that one too, I think. Okay, so this one we might not have read. It kind of sounds similar to the one where... It took the form of a shaggy black dog. But this one, number 10, so 10 stories later, nine that we've already read before. But this one says, It walked up and down the ramp all night. I was staying at my grandpa's trailer in Arizona for a couple of days with my mom, dad, and two brothers. I forget why we went out there, but it had to be important because my dad never tagged along with us out there. 
Anyways, come nighttime and everyone is asleep except me, I'm watching Nickelodeon on the TV in the living room when I hear footsteps walking up to the front porch. Since my grandpa was up there in years, he had a long wooden ramp to his door. I was expecting something to come to the door and knock, but nothing happened, except that it kept walking up and down the ramp. My grandpa lived about 25 minutes away from the nearest town, and the only neighbors around are other family members. I remember being really scared at this point and couldn't think straight. My brothers were asleep in the living room on the couches near me, and I couldn't force myself to wake them. Instead, I calmly walked to the back bedroom where my mom and dad are asleep. I lay down on the floor and try to sleep. Meanwhile, whatever is walking around outside is still doing its thing. After a couple of minutes, I hear my mom attempt to wake up my dad and see if he can hear it. This relieves me because I thought she was asleep the whole time. I tell her I hear it too and we lay there and listen. My dad is not the best at being coherent after sleep and he falls back to sleep right away. It stops after a couple minutes. The next night, the same thing happens, except it's coming up to the back door. I freak out again and this time just go back to the bedroom and lay down and go to sleep. So that's all I remember. I also forgot to mention a weird thing my grandpa said that made sense later. Before turning to sleep, he said something like, Don't pay attention to anything you hear at night. You're safe inside. I should also mention that the next day I remember seeing boot prints and paw prints in the sand by the ramp. These were not my friends. This all happened about five years ago. One night, a few of my friends decided after a night of hanging out that we'd go on an adventure at about 3 a.m. We took a ride about 50 miles to this old Spanish ruin called Cuare in New Mexico that was once the seat of the Inquisition. I can't for the life of me remember what the place is called, so we jump the front gate to the place and start exploring. One of my friends brought a flute with him and he started playing it and about 30 seconds into his mediocre playing, something started screaming really, really loud on the tops of long destroyed walls of the place. It was going from wall to wall really quick, screaming the most blood-curdling scream you've ever imagined. We got the fuck out of there, and one of my friends pissed his pants and drove for a few hours to Bandelier National Monument, where we planned to camp out for the rest of the weekend. We got to Bandelier at probably like 6 or 7 a.m. and set up our camp. After a few hours just talking about what the hell just happened at the ruins, I went to talk a piss probably. Okay, so it said I went to talk to piss, but I went to take a piss probably only like 300 feet from our camp. This is where everything starts getting a little fuzzy. I remember seeing two dust devils coming my way, and when I turned around again, two of my friends were there, and they were motioning me to follow them. I couldn't help but follow them like I was being pulled behind them in shackles. I followed them for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes and then I snapped out of it. These weren't my friends. They had bright red hair with my friends' faces and cat eyes. Both of these friends were brunette. I stopped walking and they looked at me with the most terrifying gaze I've ever seen. Monsters in movies are nothing compared to this. I turned around and ran as fast as I could back the way I came from. After like five minutes of a full sprint, I got back to the rock that I pissed at and found our camp. Everyone was there, still sitting around, talking, and didn't even notice that I was gone. I told them what happened with the lookalike skinwalkers, and we packed up everything and left probably within ten minutes and got the hell back to Albuquerque. To this day, I regret looking to my right that night. So this is another story. It was 1995. I had just graduated high school. An old friend who I haven't talked to in seven years now and I were hanging out and I said, let's go to New Orleans. And we did. We had $150 between us and back then that was more than enough. We made it to New Orleans almost died from culture shock, and turned around and headed to Magnolia, Mississippi, to get some sleep. We stayed at Magnolia Inn. It was a shithole, but it was nice and cool. It was May or June in South Mississippi. 
cool was the only adjective that mattered. We stayed up that night playing poker, drinking Gordon's vodka, and talking about who knows what. Probably girls, college, and college girls. At some point, I said, ever been to Texas? Nope. Pack your bags and let's roll. We had a road atlas. Marshall, Texas was right across the border from Shreveport. We arrived in Shreveport, made a phone call to another friend who we were actually supposed to be staying with. Both of our mothers had called looking for us. The only person that knew where we were was the buddy on the phone. It was no big deal. We would be home in a day or two. I'm being short on details because if I don't miss this, I will turn into a novel-length story about chasing armadillos and being chased by the boogeyman. Before we left the rest area in Shreveport where we made the call, we saw an armadillo. Let me tell you something about armadillos. Those bastards will hiss, jump, and turn into Tasmanian devils if you corner them. They also carry leprosy. We were 18. We chased that armadillo around for an hour. Now let me tell you about Shreveport. I don't know how it is now, but in the summer of 1995, it looked and smelled like a place where oil and metal went to die. It was dirty. It was a shithole. We crossed a bridge and saw people fishing a hundred yards from where a drainage pipe from a factory was spewing forth waste upriver from the fishermen. The locals reminded me of the locals in Adamsville, bald-headed women and cross-eyed men, a lot of bald-headed cross-eyed kids. I'm sorry, but it was a Rob Zombie movie come to life. I felt like I was going to be raped because I had a full head of hair and could see straight. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that might possibly have leprosy. Marshall, Texas was 40 miles away, so we rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Ant Festival. We stopped at a little barbecue joint and had a Coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. It was getting late and the sun was setting. We looked at the map and decided to backtrack a bit and head up rural Route 43 through Karnak, and past Caddo Lake. We would eventually run into Highway 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When we left the barbecue joint and headed towards 43, it was dusk. Highway 43 wasn't well lit. It was almost as dark as Natchez Trace Parkway. I've got a good story about using a pair of pantyhose as a fan belt for an old diesel Mercedes. Do not ever get stuck on the trace after dark, ever. My friend was driving, and we were doing about 45 miles per hour. Any faster would have been reckless, even for a couple 18-year-old dumbasses. This road was kind of like Christmasville Road. The locals reading this will know what I mean. The non-locals just have to use their imagination. It was dark, winding, full of hills that ended in curves. There were beady and glowing eyes on both sides of the road, you could hear the crickets and bullfrogs over the sound of the wind rushing by that old Sintra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. The humidity was a real thing. It was tangible. The air was thick. It smelled like pastures, hay, and swamp. We drove for what seemed like hours. It was after midnight, and I saw a sign that informed me that Bivens was the next town of any size. I was hypnotized by the yellow lines on the road. We hadn't seen another car for at least an hour, and I was sleepy. I rolled the window down and lit a cigarette. There was music coming from the radio, the tape player. It was either Tupac or Bob Seger. I smoked my cigarette, absentmindedly flicking the ashes out the window. I took one last puff and flicked the camel short off into the woods. Then I saw it. I never looked to my right. I didn't even kind of peek to the right. Maybe I did a little when I flicked the cigarette away. I don't know. What I do know is that in my periphery, there was something running alongside the car. It was just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends and before where the back of the window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles per hour. I looked at my friend, and he was looking straight ahead. I looked straight ahead. I could see it. I could see one huge arm, matted hair, reddish-brown, sticky-looking, primal. I eased my right hand over and rolled up my window. My friend was still looking straight ahead, his jaw was clenched, and he put both hands on the wheel. He sped up. 
No words were said. I looked straight ahead, and still out of my periphery, I could see the arm moving muscles and tendons vi visibly rippling beneath that matted hair. As the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside us lost pace, slightly. I then saw the hand on the end of that nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched into the fist size of a cantaloupe, a big cantaloupe. It was covered in the same hair, but slightly darker around the fingers, like it was stained with something. Suddenly, the hand clenched, and then I saw the claws, black as this damned after-midnight Texas night. Those claws were at least two inches long, sharp like animals. Sharp like an animal's. This wasn't a hand so much as it was the killing paw and claws of some beast whose only purpose was to kill and eat. I looked back at my friend. I looked at the speedometer, 50 miles per hour. I looked straight ahead. It was still there. I lit another cigarette, didn't roll the window down, and simply said, Shit! The music had stopped. I finally broke the silence and say, Hey, do you? And before I could finish, my buddy said, I see it. I've been seeing it. I can't even see you, but I can see whatever the hell that shit is. How much do you see? More than I want to. Speed up, John. Just speed up. I can't keep up forever. It can't keep up forever. I looked over 55 miles per hour. Whatever was chasing us silently was starting to lag behind. I finally looked to my right just a bit. Imagine the scary part of the movie where you put your hands in front of your face but still peek through. In 37 years, I have two regrets. One is picking up that first cigarette, and the other is me looking to my right that night. This beast was huge. Its chest was above the top of the car, and all I could see was that matted reddish-brown hair. Then it bent forward as it ran. I saw the face of this thing. All reality stopped. We no longer were driving down some country road in Texas. We were now trying to escape from the depths of a monster-inhabited hell. This thing's face is beyond my powers to describe. It was evil. The eyes were black, and the pupils were red, and it flashed its teeth at me in a snarl, yellow and huge. Saliva dripping from its mouth, it opened its eyes wide, and it looked hungry and pissed off. Then it opened its mouth. The skin pulled back until all I could see were black gums and yellow teeth. Immediately, I could feel the car accelerate. Fucking hell, John, just go. I prayed. I cussed. I lit a cigarette. Then, like sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road straightened out. Don't you slow down. We drove through Bivens, and we drove through Texarkana. Then we drove home. We never said a word. It was years later, 11 to be exact, before we ever, ever talked about it again, and we didn't talk about it much. He said he'd never told anyone, and I hadn't either. I told the story a few years back for the first time while I was parked out on a gravel road, doing the things you do when you're parked out on a gravel road with a good-looking woman. I told it a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted to hear a scary story while they sat around a campfire. They didn't sleep for a day or two, but they asked me a dozen more times to tell them the story. I never told anyone until now that I saw its face. I've been scared for my life exactly two times. Once was on that road, and once was looking at a grizzly bear in front of me with a terminal velocity-inducing drop to the side of me. Call it what you will. Call it bullshit if you want. But look me in the eyes and let me tell you this story and you'll know. Never doubt that there are things in this world that defy explanation and logic. The boogeyman is real. Some 16 or 17 years after this happened, I ran across a story in a movie called the Leg Legend of Boggy Creek from Folk, Arkansas, where the aforementioned story and movie takes place. Isn't that far from Bivens, Texas, as the crow flies? Invite me over, buy me a beer, sit on the porch with me, and I'll tell you the story over a pack of Marlboros and a few of those beers. Well, that's the end of the Skinwalker shenanigans, so far as that goes. I'm afraid to get into any more articles and repeat myself again. So I was thinking, so it begins, so shall it end. So I think we'll go back to Reddit. Um, I did pull up a little article here from Creepypasta. And the user is, wow, what is this, 23? And the story is called, Bless You. 
There was a boy, eight-year-old, named Malcolm, who had fallen ill with a common cold, and he was sneezing a lot. But one night, while he was going to bed, and the only light that was on was the restrooms, then while he was finishing up, he sneezed, and a woman's voice responded, Bless you. Malcolm poked his head out of the door to peer into the darkness to see where the sound came from. After 30 seconds of looking, he just assumed it was his mom who had head to bed after saying, Bless you. Then Malcolm finished cleaning up and turned out the light and headed to his room, but before he could close his door, he sneezed again, and the voice played again saying, Bless you. But this time, it was different. The voice sounded deeper and closer. Then Malcolm sneezed again. Bless you, came from the dark hallway, and that same thing happened. The voice got deeper and closer. This started Malcolm, and he slammed the door shut and moved a dresser in front of the door. But then Malcolm sneezed again and heard a voice behind him say, Bless you. Then in the morning, his mother was storming to his door because he didn't wake up in time for school. When she opened the door, she tried opening the door, but something was blocking it. She then called her husband, who got the door open after running at the door and pushing it with all his force, and found his son on the ground in a pool of blood with his throat slit and his intestines strung out on the floor with his eyes poked out. The mother screamed while the dad ran for the phone. Several days after the incident, the mother was cooking when she sneezed and heard, Bless you. Ew, creepy pasta. I don't like it. <clears throat> this one is from user Vecro LP, and it's called OC. I got a VR headset, but I don't want to play with it anymore. I should probably start from the beginning. I have always been interested in the latest and greatest in tech. So when my friend introduced me to virtual reality with his new Oculus Quest, I knew I wanted one. Gone were the days of needing a super powerful gaming PC with thick cables only to get a sort of 3D view of a crappy horror game with 10 pixels where you still need to use a mouse and keyboard to move around. No. The newest headsets are fully self-contained, battery-powered, and track you and your movements perfectly into the game for a seamless experience. But that is not why you're here reading this. As a matter of fact, I can promise you that I will never touch my headset again, and I really hope none of you make the same mistake that I did. The first few days were great. Fun games and fun times trying to get acclimated to having... The room around you change into a completely new place, visiting the top of Mount Everest, etc. But after a while, my girlfriend Sarah gets an idea. She could use her phone to view into the VR world and walk around me to see the world around me. While I was playing a scary horror game, she waited until the exact right time and grabbed my arm. I'm not proud to admit it, but I freaked out. If you've never been in virtual reality, you might wonder what the big deal is, but believe me when I tell you I've never been more scared in my life. It only takes a minute or so for your brain to completely accept that what you're seeing through the headset is real life. The past million year of human evolution hasn't quite adapted to the past 20 to 30 years of technical evolution. Monkey brain, easy to confuse with fancy screen. I wasn't angry at Sarah. As a matter of fact, I was quite jealous that she thought of it first. We both love to be scared, and so we scare each other a lot. From hiding from each other and jumping out and telling each other scary stories at night, but I also knew her well enough to know that such a big reaction from me would just incentivize her to do it again. So I knew I had to prepare myself. I started asking around online if there was any way I can arm myself against such an attack and after a while, I was approached by a developer. He said he made an app that would show the outline of a person if they were coming close to them because his toddler was almost able to walk and he was afraid he would hit her if she ever tried to walk with him while he was playing. It uses the headset's four built-in UV cameras to find people in the same room. The cameras are usually used to track your head movements, but the headset was powerful enough that it could do both at the same time. 
I knew this would be the perfect way to retaliate against Sarah. A couple days later, I see my girlfriend keep checking her phone and looking around me. I knew what she was doing, and when she quietly stood up, I prepared myself and directly grabbed her arms. She let out a shriek, and after a minute, she asked how I knew not only what she was doing, but know how I knew where she was. I showed her the new app, and we decided that this joke was over. I did, however, decide to keep the app after an earlier incident where I accidentally hit her arm while playing Beat Saber. Turns out the dev was on to something. Later that week, I decided to play some more VR because Sarah was watching some chick flick anyways. After a while, I noticed her outline standing up and walk over towards me. She is now standing in front of me. I ask her what is going on when I hear her voice from behind me where she was sitting. Nothing. Why? I took off my headset and looked over to the couch where Sarah was still sitting. I put the headset back on and her outline was back on the couch as the low battery warning showed up. Maybe that somehow messed with the app. I put the headset on its charger and decided to call it a night. Last week, my girlfriend decided to spend the weekend at her parents' house, so I get some time to play games again. At the end of a good day of gaming, I decide to put on my VR headset back on to play some more games. When I turn around to face my main menu, I see the outline of a person just a few feet away from me. It definitely scared me, and I quickly took off the headset to investigate. Of course, there was nobody in front of me. I knew that I had been home alone all day. The only live person I had seen all day was the pizza delivery guy. I put my headset back on and moved around a while continuously, taking my headset off and putting it back on to try to figure out what the headset could think was a person. When suddenly the figure turned its head towards me, it just stared at me and I just stared right back. For two minutes, I just stood there trying to figure out if the outline was staring at was a glitch or actually staring back at me. When suddenly it just jumped straight at me, I automatically jumped back and tripped over my own feet. What the hell was that? I thought as I took my headset off and got up from the ground. I quickly looked around the room to make sure I was still alone. And of course, there was nobody else in the room. I slowly put the headset back on and slowly looked around the virtual environment in search of the outline, but it was nowhere to be found. I booted up my laptop and messaged the dev to send me the app. What the hell was going on here? After an hour, I got a reply and he asked me if there was anything that would emit ultraviolet light, things like remote controllers for televisions, candles, or the Wii sensor bar. He told me to use my phone's camera to check around because ultraviolet will show up on a camera. I checked my entire room but found nothing. My Wii hasn't been turned on in years, my TV uses a Bluetooth remote, and Sarah doesn't want candles because she's afraid it would be a fire hazard. I couldn't find anything that would confuse the app. The dev told me he'd investigate it, but that it might be a one-time occurrence. Whatever it was, I was done playing for tonight. I don't usually get freaked out by scary stuff, but this was a bit too much for me. The next day, I had come to my senses a bit more. It was silly, just a small glitch shouldn't have scared me as much as it did, and it won't keep me from enjoying my favorite new hobby. When I got home from doing groceries, I put everything away and went to my gaming room. I closed the door. I have learned my lesson from hitting that door more than I'd like to admit and grab my headset. I hesitated a bit before putting it on, but quickly laughed and put it on. I wasn't actually afraid of some weird app, right? I turned it on and looked around just my empty space station that functioned as my default home area in VR. No outline. I sighed a sigh of relief as I started a game a couple hours later. I saw my girlfriend walk through the door into the room. I greeted her as I paused my game, but she didn't respond. She just stood there staring at me. My hand slowly reached for my headset and started shaking as a shiver ran down my spine. I knew what I was about to see, or rather, what I wasn't going to see. I slowly lifted the headset, and as I thought, there was no one there. Not only that, but the door, the door that I not only meticulously close every time was not closed, it was open. I was sure I closed it, I remember closing it, but somehow that door was now open. That was impossible, right? 
I am done with this shit. There's nothing here and it is all in my mind. I grab my laptop and connect my headset to it. I quickly navigate over to the installed apps and find the app that started all this shit. I selected it, pressed delete, and watched as the progress bar made its slow and jumpy way to the right side off the screen until I was greeted with a message that made me sigh a sigh of relief. App successfully deleted. I put on my headset again and looked around, but when I looked behind me, it was still there, staring at me. This one comes from Reddit Creepypasta, user unique, hyphen, Sherbert, 9126. My friend is missing, and he only left me a list. I have no idea what to do with it, is the title. My friend Joshua has been missing for a while. No one has reported him as missing, but I quite literally cannot confirm if he is even alive anymore. Joshua had been my best friend for as long as I can remember. We practically grew up together. Joshua was always there. The fact that he is gone is bewildering to me, to say the least. Maybe I feel so down about it because he was a comfort, no matter what I could turn to him. Those kinds of friends are rare, and you can never replace the memories you had with them by just gaining new friends. At least for me, the loss of a friendship is sometimes worse than a relationship breakup. Another big reason I am so scared is that he disappeared so suddenly and it pulled the carpet from under my feet. He didn't tell me exactly where he was going or why, just that it was important and I had to try to understand. He had at first framed it as a short leave and that it would be only a week or so. Of course, I stood by Joshua's decision. He had been having trouble at home with his wife, April, and the divorce papers were all sorted out, ready to be signed. Joshua took it hard, as to be expected. I tried to help out, but he gave me the cold shoulders, saying how I wouldn't understand because I've never been married for much less, or much less, had a serious relationship for that matter, and as any good friend would, I gave him space and didn't get hurt at, at his blind anger. It's been months now, though, and no word. I didn't expect him to go off the charts completely just because of some midlife crisis ordeal. Then again, I'm still not sure that his divorce was the reason why. Joshua truly did not leave a single thing behind. He donated all his stuff to the little family he had or gave it to April, his ex-wife. Not caring whether he lost it or not, it was almost as if he was trying to leave the face of the earth entirely. I was upset for a while because not only did Joshua vanish from my life, but he also gave me nothing to remember him by. Well, one thing, Joshua, after all the years of our friendship, gave me a crumpled up note. It didn't have a phone number to contact him by. It didn't have a sentence or two about how he would miss me. None of that. It appeared to be set up like a to-do list, since there were hand-drawn boxes you could check, except the list doesn't contain objectives, but names. There are five names scribbled crudely and apparently quickly in thick graphite. Without a doubt, it was his handwriting. Upon seeing that, an intrusive thought popped into my head. As silly as it sounded, was this a hit list or something? Had Joshua gone off to just kill people in his life that have wronged him? And he's trying to confess to me? It may not sound so silly to you since you don't know Joshua personally. Well, first of all, Joshua certainly is not the type to murder people. I mean, his recent actions have proven that he can be unpredictable, though I still can't bring myself to think that's what the list of names was about. And none of the names listed rung a bell to me at all. I decided the next best step was to type these names into Google and Facebook to see who they were. Keep in mind, Joshua deleted all his social media accounts too, so I had no way to look into his profiles and see if he had any of these people added. Anyways, the names individually typed into Facebook and Google didn't seem to connect to any people. This confused me even further because surely one of these names on the list would pull up something. As a last-ditch effort, I typed in all the names together into the search bar 
to see if maybe they were all connected somehow, like an, an event or business. To my initial delight, a web page did pull up. My joy slowly faded into a strange mix of confusion and dread when I noticed the web page title just simply said, The To Do List. I clicked on it, not knowing what to expect, wondering if Joshua had made this web page and if I was meant to even find this. But it was not much more revealing than the note itself. The page is just a blank white screen with five names written vertically in small font on the left side of the screen. After seeing this, I impulsively called Joshua's ex-wife April. I'm not sure if it was out of line and if this was somehow betraying Joshua. My mind was thinking of a million different things at that point, going from different extremes of whether Joshua's doing a sick joke or whatever reason or if he was in trouble. It took April a few hours to return my call, and she was certainly annoyed by how many times I blew up her phone. I was expecting her to give me forgive me when she heard what I found, but that couldn't be further from the truth. She just said over and over that she doesn't know what I'm talking about and reiterated that she didn't want to hear of or about Joshua again, and she hung up. So now I am just at a loss. Well, to those of you who read this all the way through, you may be wondering if I am going to reveal the names or if I will link the website that I found. I think at this point, I could use as much help as I could get into looking into this and trying to find out why the hell my friends sent me these names. Why the hell there's a website with these names? And lastly, why is it set up like a list to complete? I know it sounds like maybe I'm going insane, but this does have some seriously stressed out issues going on with it. Totally stressing me out. So if anyone wants an update or more information about the names on the website, let me know. And again, this is on Creepypasta. And this user is called unique sherbert 9126 Reddit Creepypasta user... Badera Gason, B-A-T-E-R-I-G-A-S-O-N. Woke up with a heartache. Actually, it's a headache. Jolted awake from that dream again. What a strange dream. That dream has haunted me as soon as I moved into this apartment three days ago. Covered in what appears to be dried blood and rust. Windows are pitch black as if boarded up. This apartment must look barren from outside. Cupboard doors open and hanging on by one hinge, displaying darkness inside the cupboards. As I observe the hellish room before me, I can feel the room staring back. The door to the apartment standing there, fixated in its position, is glared, fixated on me, attracting me to it, pulling me closer to it. Just when I take, I quickly felt the sudden 180 degree change in her life because now her parents had gone. She was a golden child for her parents, but was the complete opposite towards her two sisters, who had both guilt, great, built great careers for themselves at this point. Marie was going to rely on inheritance to fuel her lifestyle. And her two sisters were going to be as Marie had ordered. House warmer, she would go to the room where her parents' ashes stood. And this thought has really 